gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. And I know there's probably a variety of ways that you all enjoy experiencing the gospel. So let me give you some options. Um, it is printed on the back of your bulletin if you like to follow along with your eyes. But the earliest followers of Jesus, not many of them could read or write, and they certainly didn't have enough copies to go around uh, back in those days. So if you're open to it, I would invite you to hear with your ears and maybe even close your eyes and see what God might be speaking through this gospel lesson today. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Amen. That passage that Katie just read is um, part of what we call Jesus' farewell discourse. He knows that his time is coming to an end. And so what he wants to do is he wants to make sure that his disciples have heard and understand all of the things that he has taught them during his earthly ministry. And since we call ourselves disciples of Christ, since that is our name, the Christian church, disciples of Christ, we believe that whatever Jesus taught his disciples applies to us too. And so when Jesus promises these 12 disciples peace, that means uh, he promises his disciples in all times and in all places the same kind of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So, you know, that promise is just as good for me as it was for the disciples 2,000 years ago. And you know what? I'm fine with that because I am a, all about peace. And I know a lot of you are all about peace too. Uh, when you think about how, how many of you had parents who... When you were raising a ruckus when you were a kid, uh, how many of you had adults in your life or parents or grandparents who would say, can I get a little peace and quiet around here? How many of you have found yourself repeating that to other people that you know? Maybe your own kids or grandkids or whoever uh, is in your life. I just want a little peace and quiet around here. Uh, a lot of folks are in search of inner peace. A lot of folks pray for, for world peace. Uh, when somebody dies, our blessing to that person or that person's family is rest in peace. And I have no doubt that Jesus then understood our desire for peace. I believe that. One of the problems with peace is that it's a hard concept for us to get our heads wrapped around. Uh, it, it's hard to define, although I've got to give Martin Luther King Jr. credit for helping me in my understanding of what peace is. Martin Luther King Jr. said that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. But our search for peace 
Sometimes that has a dark side. Uh, professional negotiators, people who make a living as mediators, will tell you that it is so hard to come up with the kind of terms and agreements needed for two sides uh, to feel like that they haven't sold out or lost face during negotiations. A lot of conflicts that, I'm, uh, that, that I understand sometimes can be between families. Sometimes they can be between nations. Um, some of these conflicts have dragged on for years or generation because at one or more crucial points in time, both sides feel like they uh, have sold out or are selling out and maybe given up too much ground. No matter what you do in those situations, you've either got winners or losers, you've got victors and victims, and it's always the losers who feel like they have uh, conceded too much in order to just survive. So when you run into situations like this, it's not long until bitterness and anger erupt Vengeance and sometimes violence becomes entrenched. It becomes a habit. And this happens, you know, when you're talking about industrial negotiations. It happens when you're talking about negotiations between two warring nations or, or even warring factions within nations. It happens between religious groups, ethnic groups, gangs, families. And I'm not just talking about the Hatfields and McCoys, right? So the professional peacekeeper's job is to find some kind of a compromise so that both sides won't lose faith or won't feel like they're being sold out. Wouldn't that be a fun job, right? Uh, okay. So what about those times in our own personal lives when we're in conflict but we don't have uh, experienced negotiators there to hammer out the terms. You've still got the same problems. You've got one party who may sell out in order to secure uh, or preserve the peace. You might think, well, you know, that's just the nature of compromise. You've got to do that. That's, that's just how things are. But I want you to think about how dangerous that can be too. I want you to think about how many women and children live in fear of abusive men because they give in so that they can maintain a fragile peace, ceasefire, even though it's at the expense of their own safety and interests. And understand, I'm just using that as an example. I know there's no gender divide when it comes to that kind of conflict or an abuse, but a lot of us, regardless of gender know that gut-wrenching feeling that you get of swallowing your dignity, swallowing your pride, and settling for some sort of false peace rather than uh, speaking up. That kind of peace creates, again, victims and victors, which isn't peace at all, is it? There is no presence of justice, as Dr. King defined peace. So, when Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, but not as the world gives, I think he's acknowledging that peace, at least as the world understands peace, is inadequate. The world seems to think peace is this fragile grossly unfair ceasefire rather than the presence of true shalom, which shalom involves justice. Okay? And, and that's, what, that's what human beings crave. We crave peace without bitterness and humiliation. We crave peace without casualties and victims. We crave peace that doesn't come at the expense of someone's integrity or... Uh, interests or their dignity. We crave peace that doesn't just look good on paper, but feels good to be a part of. So, if that's the peace that Jesus is promising, 
how in the world is it ever going to be accomplished, right? How in the world is it ever going to be accomplished? How can folks who wind up the victims be protected and a new kind of peace be established? Well, Jesus says, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Okay. So we're talking about peace without troubled hearts. We're talking about peace without fear. That's what we're hungering for, right? But how is this going to happen again? And to top it off, how will it happen when right here in this passage that Katie just read, Jesus says He's going away and leaving us. So that brings us to promise number two in this passage. Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit as what? An advocate. Yeah. Now the old King James Version says the comforter. Uh, The New American Standard Version and the Contemporary English Version uses the helper or a helper. Uh, Other translations use words like intercessor and counselor. Uh, The New Revised Standard Version, which is the version that I read from most of the time and what Katie read from this morning, says advocate. So obviously we have a little translation issue here, right? And so the original Greek word that seems to have tripped up English translators over the years is parakletos, or paraclete, if you want to get down to the, to the raw form of that word. Anytime you're dealing with a dead language and you run into a word that makes you stop and say, now what? Uh, you look at examples of how that word is used in other literature. And it's not like this word is a mystery because in almost all other uses, this word is a title for the leading defense counsel in a court of law. So, according to our scripture today, the Holy Spirit is a defense lawyer. Now, you can understand why some translators over the years have said, no, no, that that can't be. How does that work? No, let's use helper or comforter or something like that. That has to be what Jesus meant. (laughs) Need the Holy Spirit? Better call Saul. Some of you get that. And those of you who don't, there's a TV show about a really slimy defense lawyer called Better Call Saul, okay? So, you know. Uh, so, so my guess is the translators over the years have said, well, what would a defense lawyer offer someone who's seeking peace? Um, maybe comfort? Maybe help? Yeah, that's it. Let's, let's translate that word uh, to comforter or helper. Okay, but why not defense lawyer? Right? Why not defense lawyer? So for this morning, I want you, this is what I want you to think. The Holy Spirit is our defense lawyer. Kind of like that bumper sticker, uh, Jesus is my co-pilot, you know. I, I like the counter to that. If Jesus is only your co-pilot, you're in trouble, you know. But, but let's do that. Let's say the Holy Spirit is my defense lawyer. When we do this, all of a sudden, it makes a lot of sense when we start talking about peace, especially when it comes to the kind of peace that the world gives, which involves, again, victims and victors. Now, now we're talking about Atticus Finch and not Better Call Saul, right? We're talking about Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird, someone who is willing to put their reputation on the line, somebody who is willing to put their family in danger, who's willing to swim against the tide of culture's tolerance for bigotry and injustice so that honest-to-goodness justice can take place. To make sure that there's a level playing field where everyone can stand on equal ground. Okay. Let's throw someone else to the the mix here too, okay? Uh, Since we're doing courtroom drama, after I got done with my little uh, series on Revelation and put a close to that, somebody came to me and said, 
why didn't you talk about Satan? How in the world can you do a study on Revelation and not talk about Satan? Okay, fine. You want some Satan with your breakfast this morning? Here we go. Back when we were studying the book of Job, we were talking about how the word Satan is a term that describes an accuser or a prosecutor in an ancient court. Okay, so peace is on the court docket for us this morning. Okay, that is on the docket for this morning. And we've got the Holy Spirit, who is uh, our defense lawyer, all in place and ready to go. Who's the accuser? Who's the Satan then? Well, the accuser is the one pushing the world's version of peace on us. Uh, the kind that seeks to make victims out of people who have already been victimized. The accuser is the one trying to make scapegoats out of people by promoting this idea that this side or that side is the obstacle to peace and so uh, must be cut off in order for the world's peace and interests to be protected. But, as all of us who have ever been victims of such peace know that that kind of peace is simply a lie. It's a peace for only a few. And it's humiliation and even death for a lot more. Okay. And even at the personal level, we know that voice. We have heard that accusing voice inside of us. The voice that accuses and condemns. We know that kind of voice. Tries to tell us that we deserve all the things that we're suffering. That we should just shut up. That we should just take it. We should just submit to it so that we can keep the peace. And you know what, dear folks? That is the real voice of Satan right there. It's not the red guy with the horns and the pitchfork sitting up on your shoulder saying, hey kid, want to smoke some pot? No. It's the accuser. The one that inspires lies like, I need to take what's mine and to heck with everybody else. The voice that says, hey, you know what you want to be? Uh, you want to get through this world? You got to realize that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and if you're going to get anywhere, you would better make sure that you're at the front of the pack. And then on the flip side of that, the accuser is also the one who goads us into thinking things like, I don't deserve to be treated with respect. I don't deserve to be loved. If I just shut up and make myself a small target, then everything will go away and there will be peace. But that is not peace. Can you see now why Satan gets thrown into the lake of fire? Uh, when, when God's reign is fully realized in, in Revelation? Because there is no room for this kind of rubbish in God's reign. Because in God's reign, when this renewed heaven and this renewed earth come into being, there won't be any more accusations. There will only be true peace. Peace like the river that flows from the throne of God into the glassy sea of God's gathered saints. A place where, like we said last week, there will be no mourning, no crying, no pain, because that old order, that old system, that old construct will pass away. See, I wasn't quite done with Revelation yet, was I? Now, clearly, there is no quick fix to the world's problems. Injustice is not eliminated with the appointment of a defense council. But you know, it sure makes a difference knowing that we have an advocate and that this advocate will be with us always. And you know what? The trial might end up dragging 
through the courts for a long time, and the Satan may continue to accuse us and call for us to be eliminated so that this false worldly peace might be secured. But our hunger for true peace in every area of our lives and in all the world may not be fully satisfied for some time to come. But man, what a difference it makes when Jesus himself says, let not your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. For the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send on my authority, will teach you everything and remind you of all I have said. It's that Spirit who will defend you and represent your interests tirelessly and without ceasing until all the world knows true peace. To begin our time of prayer together, let me invite you to listen to some of the scripture again. Again, maybe with your eyes closed, or you can follow along if you so choose. And see what words arise again for you, and what God might be calling you to let go of to have a little more peace in your own life. So hear these words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. 